All right, we are underway and um, welcome everybody. My name is John Bard. I'm one of the owners of Children's Book Insider. And um, tonight we have a really, really interesting topic, something that uh, I know we really haven't done much on, and, and, but it's, it's the way the world is working right now where everything has become international. Opportunities are now everywhere for authors. And so you're going to uh, find that very interesting tonight with our guest, Helen Wu. Before we get going, let me just take care of a little bit of business here. So um, those of you who are new to us, again, we do this every week. We started this back in March, and um, we're going to just do this every Thursday. And we're, the reason we originally created the Kid Lit Distance Social was to create a sense of community and purpose and forward momentum during a really difficult time. Uh, but staying creative, keep keeping your workflow going, all of those things are just so important. And we wanted to keep you motivated and you connected by introducing you every week to some really, really smart people from across the publishing spectrum. The day will come when this will just become the Kidlet Social, and we're looking forward to that, when we could remove distancing from the title. Uh, so this is something we'll just be doing from here on out, and we would love for you to get on our list so that you can find out about who uh, the guest is each week, and also get links to the replay. And the best way to do it, especially if you're a children's writer, is to go to writeforkids.org forward slash ultimate dash cheat sheet and uh, sign up. And what what will happen is there, you're going to get a free gift and you're looking at the cover of it right now, the ultimate children's writing cheat sheet. We did this to celebrate our 30th anniversary in business um, where we really just put down in one place the nuts and bolts, word counts, age groups, reading lists, all kinds of stuff that you need uh, to really move forward as a children's writer. It's totally free. There's no obligation. It's our gift. So go ahead and you can go there now while we're, while we're on or write it down and, and go later. But go ahead to, and get that. And that way you will also be clued in every week as to the guest and also um, to the replay links, which we'd love for you to have. Um, the, just quickly, in, in terms of introduction for the new, new folks, Children's Book Insider uh, is a monthly newsletter. In fact, let me stop the share so you can see some of this. These are all covers from various recent issues. Um, but we've been publishing it since May of 1990. And every week, we give, every month, we give you market leads, agents and editors that are looking for submissions, um, articles, in-depth craft articles, interviews with top authors. And you also see on the bottom here, these above the slush pile codes are codes that we get directly from top publishers and literary agents who either normally don't accept unsolicited submissions or have just giant slush piles and it allows you to kind of jump uh, over everybody else. So that's a, a lot of folks are getting published that way. So uh, also at writeforkids.org, you can find out um, how to become a member and it's very, very, very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. All right, let me get back to sharing and I'll get you to Laura. And with that, I'm getting off. Laura's getting on. Enjoy the Kidlet Distancing Social. I'm coming. I just have to climb over my dog, <laughs> who is a big part of our social. So, Oh, my camera's off. There we go. Yay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this week. And those of you who are new, welcome. And those of you who are here every week, thank you for coming back. So this is an easy one. Every, every week I am in front of some great literary landmark and um, you get to guess where I am. So some of you are gonna get this right away because this is not that hard today. Yes, I see some of you are already guessing it. I wanna wait a couple minutes and see how many of you guess it because a lot of you know what this is. This is one of my favorite places to visit. It's very, very cool. And I meant to check if it's open now. I think it is. I think you can go there right now. So that's really, really fun. Uh, no, it's not in Thailand. Someone asked. Oh, Zoe. Um, a couple people have gotten it 
absolutely right. I'm going to give you just a couple more minutes to see how many of you know this. You can put it in the chat box. Uh, yeah, we've got three people so far who have guessed it. Some of my very favorite characters right here, right here. Sometimes the secondary characters are the best. <laughs> Oh yeah, Zoe's t guessed Thailand because of the elephant. That's, yeah, good guess. But um, no, it's not Disneyland, Joan, but you know, I can see why you would think that. Okay, I will share. So again, uh, several of you got this right away. It is the Dr. Seuss Memorial Sculpture Garden in Springfield, Massachusetts. And it is open. It is open. John just looked it up. Hours are Monday through Saturday, 10 to 5, and Sunday, 11 to 5. So if you're in the area, you should definitely check it out. Uh, so we've got Horton Hears a Who. We've got Thing 1 and Thing 2. We've got the Lorax, uh, the Cat in the Hat. They're all there. Uh, the Dr. Seuss National Memorial Sculpture Garden in Springfield, Massachusetts. What a great place to take a picnic right now, huh? So if you do, let me know because I want to virtually join you. And since this is our 15th distancing social, we are starting a new thing this week called Where in the World Are You? It occurred to me yesterday that a lot of you probably live near literary landmarks or maybe you're passing by one um, if you're traveling somewhere and I would love to see that and I would love to feature you guys on a social and have us all guess where you are. So if you are near a literary landmark and you want to be featured on a distancing social please take a picture of yourself in front of a landmark. Try to disguise if there's like a plaque or a sign that actually says what it is. Keep that out of the picture so we have to guess. Email me a brief description of where you were and permission to use the photo on the Kidlit Distancing Social. And you can either attach the photo as a JPEG or include a link where we can download your photo if you've got it on your Facebook page or something like that. Send that information to mail at writeforkids.org. That's our general email address. And put where in the world in the subject line so I know which folder to put that information in. And we would love to feature you on a future distancing social so we can all guess where you are. Okay, so I hope to see a lot of great pictures of you. Also, we like to see you guys. You get to see us every week and we wanna see you. So I think that'll be a lot of fun. So now we get to celebrate. This is my very, very favorite part of our distancing social every week. Part of the reason we do this uh, is, you know, John told you earlier, building community, keeping in touch with our people. But everything we have done for the last 30 years is to really help you, our customers, uh, those of you who are our customers, <laughs> thank you, become the best writers you can be and to become successful children's book authors. And so when you do have those successes, we really wanna celebrate with you. And that is why we do this, this particular section. And we celebrate every part of your journey. So it doesn't have to be a publishing contract. It can be finishing your first draft, getting a literary agent, anything like that. But I've got three really great celebrations here this week. <clears throat> so Joy Nelkin Weeder, uh, contributed several illustrations to this wonderful anthology, An Assortment of Animals, a Children's Poetry Anthology, which was published by the Writer's Loft. And an online exhibit of all the book's illustrators can be viewed on the Acton Memorial Library site through July and August. And there's a link there, or you can just go to actonmemoriallibrary.org and then you can click on events and then art exhibit. And the cover here was illustrated by Brian Lee's uh, Caldecott winning illustrator. And the cool thing, if you remember our guest two weeks ago was Josh Funk, uh, and he contributed a poem to this as well. So that looks awesome. 
So check that out. And I did look at the online exhibit uh, and it's really, really wonderful. Of course, they planned to do it in person, but they moved it to an online exhibition. But then everyone can see it, which is great. Deb Gruel is having her second book, Sleepy Time Colors, released on August 11th from the Zonder Kids, Harper Collins, Zonder Kids uh, Division of Harper Collins. And isn't that an adorable cover? It's a Lift the Flap book. So congratulations, Deb. And Sean McCollum, we mentioned him a minute ago. He wrote that his middle grade basketball novel, One for All, is being released in August by Brattle Publishing and his manuscript, We Can't Go Outside, won first place for picture books in the 2020 Catherine Patterson Prize, a contest held by Hunger Mountain, the literary journal of the Vermont College of Fine Arts. And you can read his manuscript on the Hunger Mountain website there. And what's exciting, uh, Sean is going to be our guest next week, and he's going to talk a lot about, you know, turning passions into books, but I also want him to talk about entering contests because that's a really cool thing. So congratulations, Sean, for that. And I am uh, excited to hear about what might have happened with that manuscript since the contest. So be sure to come next week and hear about that. So send us your good news. As I said, we want to hear from you. We want to celebrate with you every little milestone that you reach. Email that same email, writeforkids.org, and put celebrate in the subject line this time so I can keep it straight. And we will feature you on a future distancing social. So now we get to take a poll. Yay. One of our very scientific polls. So this week's poll is, what is your favorite children's book that was not originally published in English? We're talking international publishing tonight. A lot of these very classic children's books were not originally published in English. We read them as translations. So you can go ahead and vote. And then I'll show you the results in a minute. We got a couple really close ones here. Ooh, the results are ping-ponging back and forth. And these are all, it was fun. Uh, John put this poll together, but it was really fun uh, looking through the list of, you know, basically imports of classic children's books that uh, that are such a part of our literary culture now and being reminded, oh yeah, I remember reading that. I remember reading that. Very, very fun. Okay, I'll give you five more seconds. Four, three, two, and one. Polls are closed. Share results. The Little Prince just pulls it out. Uh, close second, The Adventures of Pippi Longstocking and then Heidi. And finally, Never Ending Story and The Adventures of Tintin. That's the one I have not read, but John said he read that as a kid. So uh, there you go. And, and I hope it reminded you of some great books that you might wanna go revisit. Okay, links of interest every week. I kind of catch up on some cool stuff I've found on publishing. So this is a great piece on the Jane Friedman blog, How Do Publishers Decide Which Books to Bet On? It was a July 8th post on Jane Friedman's blog, and it was written by Anne Trubeck, publisher of Belt Publishing. And it breaks down how publishers decide whether or not they can publish a book from a profit and loss perspective. So this is when they, the editor brings in the manuscript that they love, and then a bunch of people at the publishing house have to sit down and go, can we actually make money on this book? And, and it's a really eye-opening piece on how much, you know, how high the expenses are for publishers, how little profit is built into books, and how they have to project out uh, they're investing in something that they hope two years from now is going to sell. 
And a lot of it is going on kind of hunches. So it's very interesting, but I think it will give you a lot of perspective too on the kinds of decisions that go into, that might go into your manuscript that you are submitting to a publisher and why it is so important that you do all the groundwork of making that manuscript strong and unique and saleable and giving it a commercial hook and all of those things that we talk about all the time in our newsletter and, and on our writing blueprints products so that publishers can make these decisions and have something you know substantial to base it on. Um, in Publishers Weekly, there was uh, a really great article uh, in July 3rd called the big kids books for summer slash fall and basically this is a roundup of Books that are either out now or coming out in the fall that independent bookstores from around the country Sort of anticipate being big sellers or looking forward to to selling to their customers and It kind of gives you an insight on you know people are always asking what are the trends? What's hot now? This is a good way to keep in touch with that kind of thing because the booksellers are the ones who really see what's moving. And so I created a bit.ly link that bit.ly forward slash fall big books. And I would like to remind you once again, as I do every week, you can go to publishersweekly.com to sign up for the free electronic edition of this weekly trade magazine. Normally it's very expensive, but right now Publishers Weekly is making the electronic edition free. You can get it delivered to your inbox every week. And it's really, really great information to keep up on what's going on in the industry. And then this article, this post from Slate.com, I loved. It's called Frog and Toad and Me. And it's a fascinating look at how Arnold LaBelle's Frog and Toad series, classic easy reader series, influenced modern authors like Mo Willems, Matt Barnett, John Classen, CeCe Bell, lots of people who are writing really great picture books right now. And it paved the way for exploring those very complex real emotions in children's books. And I just thought it was fascinating. And also it reiterates a point that, that I, often make where, you know, a lot of times you'll go to writing conferences or hear editors speak and they say, you need to study books published in the last five years. And that is very, very true, very important. But I always say we can't forget the books that are iconic books that, that really helped establish what modern children's books are. And Frog and Toad is one of those books, the whole series of Frog and Toad. And so once you learn how to, to read, once you read modern books and you start seeing how books are written today, you can go back and read the classics and you will see the timeless parts of those books that are, are so important and that laid the foundation for the modern books and that you can still learn from. And so I invite you to check out that piece. And I did a bit.ly link bit.ly forward slash frog and toad at 50. And I believe bit.ly makes you capitalize everything properly. So you can see on the screen how I did that. If you forget the link, go to slate.com. It was a July 3rd piece. You can just look there and, and find it. And here's a sad note, but I really wanted to, um, to say this tonight. So Joanna Cole, the author of the Magic School Bus series, died on July 12th. And she was one of those authors who helped establish modern children's books. And she had this unique gift of blending science, humor, and story in her books. And here you can see a quote from her illustrator, Bruce Deegan. He said, I think for Joanna, the excitement was always in the idea. What, why, how? And with the magic school bus, it was how to explain it so that it is accurate and in a form that a kid can understand and use. And you can actually joke around while you were learning. She had a rare sense of what could be humorous. And she certainly did. There's one more magic school bus coming out. The magic school bus explores human evolution. It's scheduled for publication next spring. If you are writing creative nonfiction for kids, 
this is the magic school bus is sort of ground zero it's sort of the the starting point of of creative nonfiction picture books and even it's spun off into uh, leveled readers it's spun off into leveled readers and even a animated series uh, so they're amazing books to study. They're amazing books to share with kids. I hope you all do. Even if you've read them, I hope you will read them again in the next few days uh, to honor Joanna Cole and to uh, celebrate her wonderful legacy that she has left us with. And again, it's proof that a great idea has legs and lasts. These books have been published for 35 years. Every single one of them is still in print. That's very extraordinary. So we will miss Joanna Cole. Now on that note, <laughs> I would love to, I'm, I'm thrilled to introduce my guest. So Helen, if you want to turn on your camera, hello, Helen. Um, so Helen Wu is a children's book author and illustrator, as well as a translator, graphic designer, and associate publisher of Yahoo Press a Los Angeles-based children's book publisher, and she is a proud first-generation immigrant. She was raised in uh, China. And Helen, you came to the United States in your 20s, right, to, to pursue a master's degree in economics. Yeah. I'm anxious to hear how that's helped you as you're uh, writing and illustrating. Um, but, and, and I'm so happy that you love to share stories uh, from your own immigrant experience. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here so we can uh, see you. And I want to ask people, uh, Helen and I are going to chat for a bit. If you have questions for Helen, we will leave a little time at the end. Please put them in the Q&A box, um, which is probably along the bottom of your screen, uh, because I'm going to close my chat box now so I'm not distracted by it. And that way I'll be able to keep track of uh, the questions. So Helen, welcome. Thank you again for joining Thank us. Thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. I love your background there, that beautiful bookcase. And it's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I set up uh, yesterday, so. <laughs> you did a great job. <laughs> so um, can you first tell us a little bit about Yihu Press and also uh, Shanghai, am I saying this right, Yihi Yi International? Is that how you pronounce it? Oh, okay. See, I was way off. <laughs> Is that sort of, are they, are they uh, divisions of the same company or how does that work? If you want to explain all of yeah. that to us. Yeah, sure. Uh, Yihu Press is an independent children's book publisher based in Los Angeles, California. It's part of Shanghai Yihu Industry Corporation, which was founded in 2007, and it published over 200 titles per year. And uh, uh, Shanghai Yihu Industry Corporation published a wide range of books, including uh, social science, arts, children's books, uh, English magazines, and textbooks. And uh, Yihu Press focused on uh, children's books since that's the genre that we could find the common grounds between different markets more easily. And uh, currently we are looking for uh, children, uh, picture books aiming uh, three to eight, and uh, we will publish the English edition in the US and the Chinese edition uh, in China. So yeah. that's exciting. That's great. So, um, and I also saw on your website that you're also publishing chapter books in middle grade in Chinese. Is that correct? Yes, we will publish uh, middle grades and chapter books in Chinese in China only. Since, you know, we just started out and we want to start with uh, picture books and maybe after a few years when we're more established, we will consider to publish the English edition here as well. Great, great. Yeah. Um, so when you're looking at submissions, mm -hmm. especially of picture books that you want to publish in English and Chinese, what are some things that you look for in terms of stories that will work in both cultures? 
Yes, actually, I think uh, anything, you know, with the universal message or universal feelings or with the like educational purpose will work uh, across uh, culturally and in different countries. And uh, we do very in-depth market research on uh, both markets and see what's already there and uh, what readers um, feel related to things, you know, this, uh, there are these two markets are quite different. And uh, yeah, the, there were some topics that are uh, very relatable to uh, readers in US, but quite remote to readers in China. So we will do in-depth market research and make sure that that's a common ground between the two markets. And uh, um, it's kind of like, uh, it's, uh, uh, we, we like also develop some like activities around. So it's not just a book, but it's have some resources to support the teachers the librarians and the parents and kids so they truly enjoy the book and uh, it's uh, have a very uh, very various reading experience around the book and uh, actually I want to give you some example like uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to Chinese culture because you know we definitely want to look for Chinese culture uh, but actually it's very hard to find the common ground between the two markets because uh, sometimes um, you know uh, books that are quite uh, popular popular in the uh, among American readers here tend to be, you know, about the Chinese culture tend to be too simple for readers in China, but they readers in China, they want some uh, books about history or about some uh, legend in ancient China, they uh, readers in uh, American will feel it's uh, too remote or it's just a hard for since they don't have that background, it's hard for them to understand some those meanings. So, um, and I also want to to uh, give you some example, like uh, some books, um, like this book, uh, it's, yeah, it's a Bring the New Year uh, by Grace Lin. That's a perfect book to introduce Chinese New Year. And, uh, you know, it's simple and sweet and uh, introduce uh, the Chinese New Year traditions. And it's perfect for American readers. But uh, I don't think this book has been translated into China because, you know, uh, since in China, uh, everyone already know these traditions. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of like uh, um, they want uh, some books kind of like touch some have a, a, like a, have a deeper uh, discussion over the topic or uh, currently uh, in recent years there were some books about like uh, pop-up books about Chinese New Year are quite uh, popular so there were a lot of uh, very very well designed elements about the book and uh, you uh, kids can move around those elements and uh, uh, you know touch and uh, flap over so a lot very well designed but some and also though in those book have uh, it has something about Chinese history but sometimes those books actually not quite good for school visit this kind of book is perfect for school visit but a pop-up book you know it's uh, suitable for, for individual reading you know it seems if you show in a distance kids won't you know they just can't touch those and you lost the point and uh, you know in China as Chinese New Year is usually a holiday so for when uh, parents or when, when family purchase those books, it's they are going to read at home. So kids will be able to read those books individually, but um, it's a different situation here. So there is another book about it. Uh, it's called A New Year's Reunion. It's uh, It was originally published in China and win a lot of awards and then uh, translated into English and published by Candlewick. Uh, it's also about a Chinese New Year holiday. And it's uh, actually this story touches some uh, social issues. This is about a, a dad that uh, comes so uh, uh, comes back home to visit her uh, with his family from a faraway city, and they uh, it's, uh, they the whole family spent a nice New Year together, and they did some uh, nice uh, s some fun activities. And actually, in the end, it's pretty uh, kind of like I will feel I will say it's a sad ending. At the, at the when the New Year is over, the dad has to um, you know go back to where he uh, works and in the end the mom and the daughter waves goodbye to the bus that takes the dad or you know the bus uh, the, to wave uh, waves goodbye to the dad who you 
you know, take the bus away. So, um, so that's very um, different readership. So when I, you know, when I, uh, to, when, I, when I do school visit in the US, you know, every year I will do school visits for, you know, at my school, uh, at my kids' school and to read books about Chinese New Year. I guess which book I will choose. <laughs> <laughs> I will choose, actually, I will choose this one. For this one, it's a nice addition to um, Chinese, uh, to a book collection of about Chinese New Year, and it's perfect to read at home to for someone who have already, um, or uh, know, so, who, have, uh, who have already have some understanding of the culture of the country, or who has experienced living in that place. And also, uh, it's nice to open some conversation, like uh, why some families have to, you know, some parents have to work in a place far away and only got back home uh, once a year or a few times a year. So that's a nice discussion, but you will see that the readership in different uh, countries and different um, uh, cultures will be very different. But I mean, both these books are all about Chinese New Year and uh, it touched the topic very differently, but they will all work. Just uh, when you uh, publish or when you write different books, you will think about, who is um, this book for? What's who are the uh, target audience? What's their uh, what they already know? What they want to know? What they can learn from this book? And uh, you may also want to develop some activities around the book to support uh, to support your uh, reading uh, experience. Like for this book, it's uh, perfect for school visit. I might develop some uh, like uh, some activity to uh, some uh, like a handcraft or. Uh, that perfect for a school visit. For this one, I might think um, it's very authentic. It's it actually shows some. Um, the uh, Chinese New Year in South part of China. And in the New Year, they actually eat uh, sticky rice balls. They, they don't eat uh, dumplings, that's a sticky rice ball. So it's very authentic. Maybe it's a good opportunity to introduce the difference between North China or South China, just some a little bit in-depth discussion. So yeah, I mean, all those books will work just so when you want to uh, write for a certain market or cross-culturally, you need to know your target audience and uh, uh, right. positioning your book well. Yeah. Right, right. Well, thank you. Those are really great examples there. So you are not necessarily looking for books about Chinese culture that you're going to translate. Is that correct? I mean, they can be stories about anything as long as yeah. it has a universal appeal to it. Yes, mm -hmm. as long as it has the universal appeal, yeah, we all welcome those submissions, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I noticed on your website there were some books about friendship, books. I saw one that was just published in Chinese, but the title was The Dog Ate My Homework, and I thought that was so funny mm -hmm. that that is a universal <laughs> thing <laughs> that kids yes. say. <laughs> yes, so, it is. Yeah. So I imagine there's certain kinds of texts that don't translate well. For example, rhyming, mm -hmm. a rhyming text would not translate. Yeah, it's very challenging. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, yeah. um, a lot of picture books are written in, written in a very lyrical way, even if they don't rhyme. Would that also be a problem? Um, fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. for lyrical, very poetic, that's fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Things, uh, just the rhyming, it's very difficult since uh, Chinese character, it's each one character, just one syllable. And for, but for English words, uh, uh, one word can have um, one or multiple syllables. So the, the meter speed just work different way. And uh, when you, you, you will know when you write in rhyme and how much effort and time you want to make everything right. You want to make the plot, the meters and beats, and uh, it also serves the purpose and serve the readership. And when it translates to another language, it's very, very challenging to make it match all goals. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and you mentioned activities. Do you want authors to come up with some activities to go with the stories and submit those to you as well? 
Uh, not necessarily. Uh, we we will develop uh, activities around that book since okay. uh, different books will uh, will be suitable for different kinds of uh, circumstances. Uh, like some books uh, might be perfect to develop some uh, like handcrafts or um, uh, like recently we acquired not recently two months ago we acquired Amelia Hoffman's uh, book new book uh, how to make a mean monster. So that's a working title. Recently we we come up a new title, but that that. Uh, since her art, art style is uh, very, uh, he she used a lot of uh, hand drawn cutouts and uh, a lot of mixed media. Like one page, she used uh, some garbage bag and some you know uh, some other stuff to make it looks like a monster. So that uh, mixed media is perfect to design some uh, like handcrafts or invite kids to use uh, materials around them to make their own unique monster. So that book is perfect for this kind of activity. For some other books in my, if it has a lot of characters that have some conversations, it might be good to develop a performance around that um, story. And so uh, students can act it out, it will be very fun. So usually I think um, it will be great. Of course, the author want to have this idea it will be great, but uh, we, yeah, it's majorly on us since after acquisition, we will do a lot of revisions and maybe the storyline will change somehow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you also looking for illustrators to submit samples of their work? Um, yeah illustration assignments is there a particular styles that you're looking for um, no, we are really open to any kinds of styles. We have different kinds of books. So yeah, we are really open to any kinds of style just to yeah, surprise us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Um, so are the, the English and the Chinese editions published simultaneously uh, yes. at the, in, in both countries? Okay, so that's very exciting then to, mm -hmm. to have that. And do you tend to keep the same covers on both editions or does, I know sometimes when they translate books, they change the cover for, mm -hmm. um, for like older books, novels. Mm -hmm. In picture books, do you try to keep the same cover? Yeah, I think we will keep, uh, we like to keep the same cover unless it doesn't work. But I mean, keep the same cover. I feel since we publish simultaneously, so it will better for marketing. So they were same book in, and uh, you know, similar covers, just the different titles and it looks very cool. So we, and since, you know, we will take all uh, factors into consideration in this early uh, acquisition process. So we will do like market research. So we will make Make sure the cover works in both markets. Right, right. That's great. Now tell us a little bit about your own writing and illustrating. Yeah, I started uh, write. I, actually, uh, I started the uh, a ma in major of economics, and I uh, got my first job in the marketing uh, related to the field. And then I needed to uh, make some marketing materials, and I got to uh, learn how to use Photoshop. And I discovered that yeah what you could do in that program that a lot of people join that program it's really cool so i kind of like um did a lot of uh, digital drawing and uh, put up an online portfolio and uh, someone came to me and asked me could i um illustrate their children's books which i actually the first time i realized all oh, that a uh, job uh, it's a uh, called illustrator and that's uh, kind of like a real thing and uh, you really can yeah <laughs> kind of like uh, uh, make money from that thing it's really cool so I uh, start to illustrate for this authors and gradually um, uh, and of course they are all self-published authors and uh, I got involved in every step of book making from like illustration uh, layout design and uh, book cover design and the format the file to get print ready so yeah, every step and uh, I, I, I think maybe I could write my own story as well. So yeah, in 2014 and when my son was born and I got ideas to write stories and what, what was inspired by, you know, <laughs> by him. So um, I started to write and illustrate more and more books. And uh, after I self-published those books and market among my uh, family and friends, I feel like I wanted to um, more, I wanted more than just a book out there. I wanted the book that could be carried by bricks and mortar bookstores and could reach a wider audience. 
So I, and then I discovered, oh, the book, the the route I t the route I take was called um, uh, self publishing, and I should actually take traditional publishing. So that's how I switched to traditional publishing, and I started touring agent and sign up with agent, and uh, went on submissions, and uh, also joined a lot of uh, creative groups and attend uh, SCBWI uh, conferences, and uh, and uh, that last year I uh, attended uh, SCBWI uh, Los Angeles conference. Uh, that's where I met Yihu team. They wanted someone who could speak Mandarin and uh, English and also had experience in children's book industry and uh, have connection with US authors. That's kind of like uh, how, yeah, my background uh, is perfect fit for their criteria. That's how I joined the team and got this opportunity. <laughs> So yeah, I, I feel, you know, though I self-published a lot of books before and I, uh, I learned a lot from that experience and, uh, and all those, you know, publishing is really a long journey and you can't get to that goal uh, overnight, but you all learn from all these attempts and all these fails and all those back and forth and all those um, rejections. So as long as you keep going and keep learning and uh, it's going to be a fun journey. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Well, congratulations to you on all your success and how you've really created a wonderful niche for yourself in that you were perfect for this job that you have now, um, as well as, you know, all of your uh, success with your own books. So <clears throat> because you have sat on the other side of the desk as well as an aspiring author and illustrator. Um, how does this affect how you might uh, approach working with authors and illustrators in your current position? Um, do you feel it gives you a lot more insight into sort of their own process and what they've gone through to get to the point where they're submitting a manuscript to you? Yes, definitely. Uh, that's sometimes I, uh, I definitely, it helps me um, understand those struggles. And I, since I got rejections for my own manuscript as well, I understand why some manuscript got rejected. Sometimes really, uh, you know, editor might say it doesn't fit our list. And that's really the truth. Every publishers have their own list. And some, like for us, we, since we need to publish in both markets and for some uh, manuscript, it really works well in one market, but just it doesn't fit the other market. So we have to reject those manuscripts, even actually they're pretty good if we only publish one market in my fit hour list. So every publisher also have their own, uh, like our style they're looking for or some specific topic they're looking for for that season. Since usually um, publishers develop a, a list of uh, titles for a category, so that's uh, for a catalog. So that's for that season or, you know, several seasons. So usually they have a theme or something they want to focus on. It, uh, this uh, submission might not fit that list, so they have to pass. So it's, uh, so it really, it's about timing and it's about, yeah, it's really about luck. So sometimes if you got rejections, really don't feel disheartened or discouraged. It's just keep submitting. And sometimes you will get nice rejections. Say this uh, project doesn't work, but maybe there were some, uh, we really like your writing and you're welcome to submit to us some other project and hope we could connect over that. And sometimes uh, it's, uh, they, they have some feedback over the manuscript, like uh, the plot is a little weak or the character needs some work. So all these are very valuable feedback and you can use that to revise your manuscript, make it a better one. And probably in the next round of some other publisher, you could find the best fit. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So we're going to get to questions in just a second. I just wanted to um, note some of the very interesting things on your submission guidelines, which are available on your website. Mm -hmm. So the Yahoo. Uh, y e e h o o press. Mm -hmm. It's it's yehoopress.com, correct? The, yeah. 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 And then yeah, the Yihu actually is the kind of like a close pronunciation of Yihu. That's how we uh -huh. come up with this name. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and they have submission guidelines on there, but um, you you list some sort of areas, concepts that might work cross-culturally, and a lot of them are make total sense. Um, 
And then you have underrepresented voices, uh, hands-on experience like inventions, problem solving, cooperation, those sorts of things. Critical thinking, such as analytical thinking, open-mindedness differences. I thought that was very interesting and important to have on those guidelines. Uh, you had symbols, and there were three of them there. Dual representation, mm -hmm. essence and appearance, and theory of mind. Mm -hmm. And there's an explanation of each of these on the guidelines, but I thought those were very interesting. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and how those might work into a picture book. Yeah, actually, these three uh, concepts are a nice uh, extension of our current collection. This year, we will publish 10 books, but in Chinese and in China only. And they all, uh, this collection, you know, in China, books are published and promoted differently. Usually in US, every book stands alone, even if the theory, but once you only publish one book, and maybe after two years, you publish a sequel. But in China, it's very common that publishers put, put um, a collection of uh, books, like from three books to 10 books together by different authors and different illustrators, but they all have something like, a, have a similar, a big theme, and they will promote the books together. So uh, currently we have a collection called uh, Little Thinkers there about uh, children's philosophy, and they all touch some very big and abstract concepts like uh, death, like uh, um, existence, like like uh, evolution, like uh, the origins of life. So a very big and uh, complex and uh, abstract concept. So um, like, for example, the death, uh, why the, the topic is about death itself. It's not about how to deal with the grief when it comes death. It's a, it starts with a frog who eagerly wants to eat a bug. So of course the bug doesn't want to be eaten and he doesn't <laughs> want to die. So well, they, they, during this chase, uh, they have a lot of fun and humorous conversation and they ask the question about what does death mean for a bug, for a prey or for a predator, for um, plants and for flowers, for the star, the planet, or and for human beings. So, you know, it uh, kind of like asks a lot of um, this kind of big questions and uh, uh, try to um, encourage kids to think about this concept. But this collection's uh, aiming for older age group, therefore six to uh, age, uh, children ages six to 10. And uh, they are pretty lengthy, uh, some of them above six, uh, 50, 60 page or longer, and uh, several of them above of uh, 1,500 words. That's why we don't plan to publish them here since, you know, we are new in print and we want to start with the typical uh, picture book format. Uh, but that three concept is kind of a nice extension to, you know, the, our current collection. And th we want to see if we put it into our manuscript wish list and if uh, there is any submission that touch these topics, maybe we can make a second collection that work for both markets. And actually, uh, any stories that touch that um, concept will be, you know, will fit our list. We we don't we don't have as specific requirements of what this story needs to look like. It, it could be very poetic or like uh, um, very, uh, or it can have, it's like a typical um, story have like uh, three attempts and conflicts and uh, then a, a, sac a satisfying ending, or it can be um, uh, like, a, like a graphic novel. Actually that death book, it's a, a graphic novel format. So um, as long as it touch those concepts as the author's defeat will be good, yeah. Okay, great, great. You know, <coughs> excuse me. Is it, would it be useful for authors to look up what children in China are studying at different grades to, to sort of compare with what the kids here are studying at the same age to get a sense of if topics would translate well? I don't know if there's, uh, you know, here you can you can look up websites where it's sort of a universal curriculum for second grade, you know, standards. Do they have such things in China? Uh, is it that standardized? 
Yeah, I think they have, but uh, I don't think authors need to do that since it involves a lot of work. And yeah, uh, uh, yeah and I think those materials are probably in Chinese. <laughs> so, oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah, so it's very hard. So if the author knows some, you know, know Chi the, the background in China would be helpful, but it's not really, it's not needed. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So we have a couple questions here. Um, Melva asks, would it be taboo to write a picture book about the terracotta soldiers? Or are there some taboo topics out there that you just don't want to see or you don't think would work in, in the Chinese culture? Um, uh, we don't really have a taboo thing. It really, uh, I see the death book at first we think that's kind of really difficult right. topic to touch but actually we start from that topic so um like uh, we have to see the manuscript to see if it really fits um like for example my own story is actually I submit to our team and rejected by them last year but uh then I revised a lot and I think it's a much stronger one so um it's about a Chinese dragon goes through western dragon school so um, as for in the previous draft I since it was inspired by my own immigrant experience so at, in previous draft I focused a lot on the immigrant uh, background, but actually Ch uh, China is not an immigrant country. Actually, 95% of people don't have experience in living overseas. So when you focus on the immigrant background, you actually set distance with your uh, uh, target audience. So in the revision, I put the image, since, you know, it's a dragon school. So I put the, um, the immigrant background to the uh, author's notes and I tweak the start like the dragon is new to town. So, um, so even people don't have immigrant experience could, you know, recognize this uh, feelings, you know, you are new to town since people nowadays, people move around a lot. And I also change it to the first day of Dragon School. So kids mm -hmm. will immediately, you know, recognize that feeling. That's the first day of school, especially for new dragon. It's a Chinese dragon goes through a Western Dragon School and uh, he breaks of water, but discover all others breaks fire. So that's kind of like uh, with just a small tweaks the story will work so we need to see the manuscript and see how we can do some small tweaks so it fits the market better mm -hmm. great great um do you look for own voices in submissions so for those of you who are new to us and might not know that term uh own voices are people from different communities who are writing about stories from their community uh, whether it's cultural or religious, etc. Are you looking for diverse authors and uh, voices from all different kinds of cultures? Yes, absolutely. Currently, yeah, we we have signed a, a few uh, manuscripts in there from diverse authors, and uh, we yeah we really looking for those, and uh, uh, I think it will 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 be very interesting to uh, add to uh, the Chinese market, and also works perfect uh, cross culturally. But again, we need to see the manuscript and see how it could work better and uh, reach a wider audience. Mm hmm. Okay. Um, Sean asks, would you describe differences between the reading cultures of children in China and the United States? Um, and just to add to that for myself, are, are, do children in China read at a younger age than we do here, for example, or is it about the same? Uh, is the text, the complexity of the text a problem? Um, I do feel like um, in China, parents tend to uh, purchase books with more educational purpose. So sometimes for lengthy books are uh, kind of like uh, sell well there. If the books is very short or um, it's it's okay, but it, it, you probably need some nice design there. There actually, I have a book. It was actually originally published uh, in Japan. It was by a Japanese author and illustrator. And this sold three million copies. It's very simple, but it has some nice cutouts. Like uh, it shows mm -hmm. the, uh, the landscape of Japan. It, it, so every page you see, it, it's actually a series of books and every book they have different cutouts. And uh, 
the it, it, and the in another book which I don't have a hand it's actually every page of different colors shows different landscape and it's a rainy day and by the when you turn to the last page all the seven colors becomes a rainbow so the, it's so for like uh, shorter and simpler books we probably need to think some other ways to make it more interesting maybe some nice cutouts or some different um, you know, elements we add to the book mm -hmm. great Great. Um, and then the sort of average length of picture book text that you are looking for mm -hmm. right now, uh, is it a thousand words or less about? Yes. Since okay. we want the book fits both market and you know in the US market and uh, your yearly publishers are looking for shorter books. So that's we really need to reach a nice balance between the two markets. Mm -hmm. Not too short, not too lengthy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think uh, uh, the, like uh, fewer than a thousand words or around 500 will be great. Okay, great. And then are you um, taking submissions for the chapter books and middle grade that would just be published in Chinese? Yes, at this moment. Yeah, since, you okay. know, we just started. Yeah. <laughs> right. And what what is the length average of, say, a chapter book or a middle grade novel that you might be looking for? Um, less than uh, 50,000, I would mm -hmm. say. Okay. And you, of course, provide the translation so people can submit in English. Yes. Okay. Terrific. Terrific. Uh, let's just see if we have any more questions here. Um, oh, Amber asked about books about nature. Is nature a good um, topic? Of course, the landscape might be very different in different countries. Mm -hmm. I imagine you have animals there that we wouldn't necessarily find in nature here, or vice versa. So, but it's an opportunity for, for children to learn about another culture as well. Yeah. So is that, um, is that topic something you might be interested in? Yes, yeah. We actually currently we are uh, we want to develop a series of non uh, uh, creative nonfiction, but we are still um, doing market research. Since when it comes to non uh, creative nonfiction, it could be about nature, it could be about uh, some historical figures, or it could be about some social issues. So uh, we want to kind of like we are still doing market research. If we do a, a, a collection of one topic or have a combination of different topics mm -hmm. so but yeah we welcome submissions about nature great great uh someone asks if you accept easy reader submissions so again for those of you who might not be familiar with that term those are books designed for kids who are learning to read on their own as opposed to picture books which are meant to be read out loud to a child so they have shorter sentences simpler grammar mm -hmm. are, is i imagine those might be hard to translate uh, because of the sentence structure and that kind of thing. I don't know. I might be wrong there. Yeah, I think for uh, easy readers, I, uh, early readers, I probably we probably will, will want to develop from the um, uh, picture book. So once mm -hmm. we have a character-driven stories, uh, we develop a series of that character. It will be easily to develop uh, like early readers or like board books around that character. It's uh, yeah, just easier to develop around the picture book format. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Great. Uh, Melva asks, is fantasy popular in China? Yes, yes, very popular. I think a lot of several uh, best-selling uh, works are fantasy, yes. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Lynn, I'm going to ask you to clarify this question. You asked, do editors of the magazines and the books share information? Oh, oh, I see. Tell us about, you also have a magazine mm -hmm. uh, your company does. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, we the magazine is uh, called uh, Phoenix English Magazine. It's for English learners in China, and uh, they also accept uh, submissions. And uh, they will uh, actually we have some sample pages on our website, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, authors could click on the sample page to get the feel of what kind of uh, articles they publish. And uh, um, and uh, yeah, for for picture books we pay advances and the royalties, and for magazines we pay 
plant-based. So, and since it's about, they have different levels uh, for, uh, I think, um, for age, for children's ages six to 15. So it has a quite wide range of topics they will publish. And uh, I think, yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, we're welcome to submissions, yeah, to our okay. magazine. I think what Lynn's question here, now I understand it, is say someone submitted a manuscript to you as a picture book, and you think it's not going to work, but it might work for the magazine. Oh. Do you refer it there? I mean, is or or would they have to resubmit to the magazine then? Okay, they need to resubmit to the magazine. Since um, actually for picture books, we have editors here in the U.S. will do the actual editing and uh, also participate in our acquisition process. Um, our actually, uh, we have a team of editors in China, and also we will collaborate with, with uh, American editors who they all they all have experience in large publishing houses such as Penguin, such as. Um, uh, DK publishing, so they have years of experience, and they also have, um, you know, have better judgment of the market and what would work in the U.S. market. So, mm -hmm. um, so for uh, after the for picture books after uh, acquisition, our American editor will do the actual editing, uh, and for uh, English magazines, our team in China we have a, a, a separate team to handling the magazine, and they will do the editing for the magazine. Since you know. So for English learners in different uh, country will be different. Like, uh, you know, I feel it's the same thing for Chinese learners here. Usually when they, uh, for the topics they are interested in, but they're the, they don't know how to use, uh, you know, when they read the books that, that for the, that age group, uh, they will, to, the language level will be too high for, you know, the, the, the learner as learning that language as a second language. And so you need to have a nice balance of the age group and uh, how you express that meaning in a simpler language. So right. that's, uh, yeah, so our editors for the magazine in China have uh, better uh, experience in uh, dealing with uh, language learners, as, you know, for English as a second language. So, but for here, uh, for picture books, since we're aiming to the, uh, the audience here in the US whose native language is English, that's a very different level of uh, right. language, yeah. Right, no, that's a really good point. So the writing would be completely different. Yeah. 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 Okay, just a couple more great questions here. Um, are kids in China familiar with the same classic fairy tales that the children in the US would be familiar with? So if you wanted to write a story based on a classic fairy tale that kids know here, would it also be familiar in China? I think it depends on what kind of fairy tale, like a Snow White, like um, uh, like uh, like uh, uh, the uh, uh, Little Red, Red uh, Little Riding Hood. It's it's very familiar to children in uh, to children in China, but some others like. Uh, Goldilocks and three pandas. Uh, my, I mean, they still know that. But uh, I, I actually, I was very surprised to find that the the uh, there is a Chinese uh, there is a Chinese New Year book. Uh, you know, it's a retell from that story, but it wasn't translated and introduced to China. So I think maybe because uh, readers in China are not as familiar. Uh, they, some of them know that story, but. Maybe most don't know. So uh, it depends on what kind of fairy tale. <laughs> right. Well, and I imagine if the story is written well, it doesn't matter if they have familiarity with the yes. fairy tale. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, last question here, which I think is a really great question. What's your approach to uh, selling international rights to the books? So do you ever license the books to be translated into other languages uh, by other publishers. Yeah. 
so far we uh, we started from the U.S. market and then the China market, but our team will attend uh, all those famous international book fairs like London book fairs, like uh, Tokyo book fairs, and uh, since our office is located in Shanghai, and uh, the Shanghai International Children's Book Fair is already uh, becomes mm -hmm. the second largest children's book fair in the world. So uh, this year they will also set a booth there. So that's a great opportunity to present and promote our books to uh, foreign agencies and publishers. And uh, since we will also develop some uh, merchandise around the products, in, like uh, currently we are developing board games and uh, we will have like uh, activity sheets and uh, uh, coloring books around the, uh, the book. So we will have kind of like have a whole package to show mm -hmm. foreign agencies and publishers. And that definitely helps to sell the book internationally. Right. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Helen. This has been wonderful, very educational. I appreciate you coming on and sharing all your knowledge with us. Um, I want to remind everybody, you can go to yahoopress.com and click on their submission guidelines. They're very detailed, give you a lot of great information. And I also want to remind you all to not rush to submit. This is not something that's going to go away anytime soon. And I want you to take the time to really revise your manuscript, get it as good as you can, take it to your critique group, really work on it before you submit it because we don't want to flood <laughs> publishers inboxes with material that's not ready. So um, thank you again so much for being here tonight. We really thank enjoyed you so chatting with you. Having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, and thank you all for being here and we will see you next week. Bye.